Segway, to continue at once with the next musical selection or composition. Segway, to make a transition directly from one section or theme Segway, to another. Segway, to move smoothly and unhesitatingly from one state, situation, condition, or element to another. Segway, to perform in the manner of the preceding section. Segway, to make a transition from one thing to another smoothly and without interruption. This is Segway with Dean Aldemaro Romero, a weekly program exploring the lives and work of the people of the College of Arts and Sciences at Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville. Hello, everybody. Professor Erin Guignot Dimick was born in Hartford, Connecticut. She obtained her bachelor's in fine arts from the Massachusetts College of Art in Boston and her master's in fine arts from the University of the Arts in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Today, she is the interim director of the University Museum at Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville, where we are both uh, recording and taping this uh, show on location. So that's why our audience will feel some kind of a different ambience in the sound. So welcome to the show, Dr. Uh, Professor Vigno Dimic. Thank you so much. Uh, I understand that you started your career in the arts as a photographer. Yes, I have a father who's an architect, and back in the 60s he had a Nikon camera and taught me as a very young child to use it, and I got very engaged um, in photography, definitely as my first uh, love in the arts. Okay. So, do you still practice photographer, or do you have evolved to different fields as time went by? I definitely still use photography a great deal in my work and uh, enjoy photography uh, as a uh, personal pursuit, but uh, my work has evolved uh, from photography into printmaking, then into book arts, and finally into uh, book conservation as a profession. So let's talk about now books as a, a, a pieces of art, because a lot of people don't realize that they are accustomed to see the typical books, but the fact of the matter is that they are many publishers that publish books that are real pieces of art, even with covering metals, uh, books that are not even the typical shape, but they are round, uh, that are very small, or very big, uh, you name it. So do you think that the, with all this electronic availability of books, is it an art that is being lost? You know, it's a really complex question. I think that the uh, books, you know, uh, as objects are still very, very important to us. And one of the reasons that we teach books um, as a subject in the art department is that it allows students to really deal with a much more complex idea, both of space and of time. It's almost like a precursor to filmmaking. And they're able to sort of see ways in which they can create far more deep and compl complex ideas. Um, I think that uh, increasingly we are reading digitally, we are searching digitally, there are so many ways in which we use text in those ma manners, but it doesn't uh, give you the same experience as holding the object in your hands and the kind of personal nature, that relationship that you have with the book as an object. And I think that artists who work with uh, books as an object are trying to still get to that, still increase that personal relationship, that one-on-one. -on -one that you have. Now, with all this moving into the electronic format, and by the way, today there was an article in which uh, some libraries are complaining that publishers are raising the prices of electronic uh, format for books, which defeats the purpose of publishing them you know, on paper. And the fact that also paperback is the cheapest way to publish a book. Do you think that book binding in a way is an art that may be in danger? I think that certainly what we once knew as kind of people who collected books and how those books are produced in some respects for the larger audience, that's definitely probably going away. But there's a use of books that's really different. When you use a reference book, it's a very different experience than using a, um, an electronic resource. Your ability to flip back and forth between pages, the way that you sort of acknowledge information, for instance, and in my own reference work, book here, I was thinking of this as I came over, this is a reference work that I published, and people use this at the table when they're referencing objects. And so in this, although it appears to be a paperback, it's actually sewn. 
because it makes it possible for people to open it again and again, to lay it flat, to compare the photographs that are in here with the actual objects. And it's kind of a little bit of a different relationship. I mean, certainly iPads are making that a lot easier for us. But this was something that was meant for maybe uh, areas where they did not have access to that. And, and this still, it's very stable. This is a very stable object. You know, you can't, um, it can get wet, but it still, it still handles well. So I think that book binding by hand has become very refined and very small. But it goes along with many of the arts that we still love and appreciate. Ceramics and metal smithing, weaving, um, other forms of dyeing that are done by hand that you cannot replicate with digital. I think they can exist side by side. By the way, for those in our audience who wants to actually watch these interviews uh, through our, the link that we post uh, the Monday after the show is being aired by WSIE, they can do it by going to the website of the College of Arts and Sciences, go to Segway and see the web version of it, uh, because in that way you can see the books that you're showing uh, to us, to our audience directly, how they really look like. Now, uh, when people hear about the term book preservation, especially younger audiences may think, oh, you mean digitally. But actually, you're talking about something quite different, right? Oh, yes. I mean, there is a very important avenue for preservation through digitization. And for many items that you can't allow hundreds of people to uh, look at, especially items that people, lots and lots of people want to look at, some of the most original research, the Gutenberg Bible, uh, records in the National Records Administration of Eisenhower. We do make digital copies of those kinds of things in order to increase their access. But there's stuff that does not come out in a digital copy. The qualities of print marks or plate marks, um, aspects of certain signatures and prints. And if you're a first researcher, now these are blank books, but if you're a first researcher and you're looking through a book, you can really see the hand, the notations. Sometimes it's a book that was owned by someone. It wasn't written by them, but it was owned by them and then used in their own practice, whether they were a scientist or a philosopher. And you can't see that always in the digital image. And so when we talk about book preservation, one of the things we're really trying to do is to make books accessible. The point of it being, if a book cannot be opened, if it cannot be held, the pages cannot be turned, then it's not useful to us. Then it just becomes a brick of paper. And so a lot of what libraries and museums are doing is making things so they can still be accessed by researchers. If they have to limit it by using preservation to kind of make it accessible to a larger public, that's a great step. But original researchers really do want to experience the object and really see the page and really understand even more the experience, perhaps, that a reader of that era had once they were holding that book. So well, what you are saying basically is we need to keep training people in book preservation because it's a big need for that kind of work uh, in archival uh, environments, in libraries, and special collections, and the like. So let me ask you this question. Is there a job market for people who have that kind of um, uh, skills? Uh, there is. It's not a very big one, but I think that overall, um, communities, states, uh, federal agencies are becoming more and more uh, to understand how important that preservation is. Um, there certainly are items which will fall apart unless digitized, so that's one way of preservation. Uh, there are items that, you know, people want to access um, in terms of records, you know, to look back at civilian records or, pardon me, military records, and being able to see those papers is really important. When I was at Princeton University, for instance, the um, author, um, Toni Morrison, had a fire and all of her records uh, got burned and we actually took everything out from piles and encapsulated what was left so that all the notes from her novels could be kept so they could still be seen by her and by future researchers. And the only way that can be done is by trained professionals. We encapsulated every page so that we could see how she made the notes, how she sort of developed her novels in those that, you know, basically it was a house fire. Now, um, basically, so what we're dealing here is with an issue of really taking care of very valuable material that maybe sometimes we don't realize right now what the use of that may be, but probably researchers in the future will. And I was wondering that given the huge amount of published material that is there in so many libraries and private collections around the world, what do you think are the major threats 
to the preservation of old books, particularly I mentioned old books because there was a time where old books, all of, of the books are actually were published with acidic paper that tends to decompose and all kind of things. So what do you think and are those major environmental factors that can affect the uh, life of a book? Well, certainly uh, where books are housed. I mean, the sort of conditions in which they are held, levels of heat and humidity are always really, really important, and that's something that um, libraries, archives, and museums are always very, very conscious of environmental controls. Um, then I think, too, there is a long period of um, post-industrial um, paper that before we recognized it, it went on for approximately 100 years before we recognized as librarians and conservators that that was not going to be uh, retrievable, that that paper was going to continue to fall apart because the chemicals it was made with. And now we've made changes. The stuff pre-industrial revolution, not so bad, really. It still flows, it still works. Those are the books that we can still often look at. Their bindings sometimes make them harder to look at. But, um, but their paper is usually um, in pretty good shape and we can sort of rehouse them or put them into a new uh, a binding so that people can access those pages. We are uh, recording this interview actually at a corner of the library of the University of Museum where people can see a lot of books. And there is this phrase that is bookworm, <laughs> which is basically to tell people that someone really likes to read books all the time. But I wonder if still the actual bookworms in libraries is still a problem in libraries around the world. Uh, definitely um, past infestation is still a problem. And that's something that libraries are constantly dealing with, how to uh, be able to manage pests while not uh, harming humans. Um, but one, another really large issue often is mold. Mold is a, a really creeping and insidious character. Um, and in many histo smaller historical societies and personal libraries, that's something that often you know, really will uh, damage and can creep right across the cover of something and, and then it's lost. Okay. Well, as an expert in, in book preservation, uh, please walk our audience through the process of what you do when you receive a book or you find a book that has pages that are becoming loose, that the cover is falling apart. So what is the process? Uh, like a, a physician who sees someone who is sick, how, how do you go about doing your job? Well, I think that there's both a sort of uh, object-related or physical um, uh, inventory that you have to do, and then you also have to do a his histor historical inventory, because you really need to understand, is that an original binding, or is that often um, in the 19th century and early 20th century, books were rebound for uh, you know, decorative purposes. People love to have all of the leather match their books on the shelves and have everything in their collection match. And they would frequently, when something fell apart, they would redo it with their stamp and their particular gilding and all like that. And one of the things that we're always looking at um, in preservation is what is historical, what is not historical, and what's the choice that we make about whether or not we keep that. Is that interim binding important to us? Many times in libraries that I worked at, we would decide it actually had been rebound twice and that those particular bindings had no relationship to that original text and they were in bad shape. So then we would put on a brand new but very um, accurate housing, but a modern one, in order to um, uh, keep it safe, make it work. One of the things that we're always looking at when pages are falling out and covers are falling off, is the book handleable? It's one of the most important things I think about when I uh, look at something. I look at its history. Do I need to keep those parts? And then that sort of creates some of the assessment. But then secondly, anything that is torn, broken, falling out. I want to not only put it together, but put it together so that you can open it. Anything that's held, you know, many books are bound very tightly. And when you go to sort of, you know, open them this way, it, you can't see much in them. You know, and so my goal is to have a book that can open like this so you really can experience it. So as a conservator, a lot of methods have been developed over the last 30 years or so that really speak to how do we create access while still retaining um, historical accuracy as much as possible. Now, when one visits uh, famous libraries, let's say like the Library of Congress, they always have on exhibit uh, some very old books, very famous books like uh, Gutenberg's Bible, for example, or something along those lines. But they put them in a case, but one can tell that there's a different type of glass there, and certainly the environment inside is different. 
And if you go one day after another, you can even see that they are passing the pages. Yes. It's not the same. So this tells me basically that uh, book preservation is a very delicate and time-consuming business. Oh, yeah. I mean, it takes 10, sometimes hundreds of hours, especially with large volumes, to put them back together, to put them into these um, states where they can be read, researched, exhibited. Um, often, you know, in terms of exposure, not only is the case made of uh, a, a glass which filters some of the harmful rays of light, but it also, the turning of the pages both allows people to see separate pages as you move through. It's one of the experiences of a book that you can't get in a case. You know, you see one page when you go one day, but often if you have an understanding of an exhibit, they will. Sometimes they'll show multiple copies, so they'll show different sections of the same uh, volume, or as you said, they'll show a different page a day. This also uh, keeps any of the fugitive colors, any of the colors that are uh, not merely black ink, any of the uh, hand tinting or hand coloring, really we can't expose that for too long because um, it will be much more susceptible to fading. And so by exhibiting it maybe only for one day or two days and turning the page, then they have protected um, those fragile colors. Now, when one thinks about books, you have a conventional idea of what a look, book looks like. But in fact, the diversity is very big. Uh, there are even books that are not printed, they were hand-printed in Quinquinabula, uh, the sort of things. And in fact, uh, the first largest library known Alexandria in Alexandria, the books that were not books were actually rolls in yes. there. And a uh, few years ago, it was discovered the famous Dead Sea Scrolls that had to be put together. But that took years and an entire team of people just trying to do that. So I wonder is, is there funding out there from federal agencies or private foundations uh, in order to provide the finances for the experts to do such a delicate job? Grant funding is definitely a big part of conservation and preservation. Um, when I was in uh, New York at the New York Botanical Garden Library and also when I was at Princeton University Library um, and in the regional center I worked at in um, Philadelphia, uh, we would frequently write grants to both um, private foundations but also um, the NEH. Um, there are grants out there and really this idea of really focusing in on a specific project and creating, uh, you know, essentially an academic argument for what its importance is to a particular institution, uh, its researchers, um, what, how those purposes will fit with the foundation or uh, agency that's, that's governing it. Um, in fact, my very first job was a grant-funded job. Um, I worked at the New York Botanical Garden uh, housing a collection of 250,000 architectural plans um, of the Lord and Burnham Company, just as we own here at SIUE the Burnham and Root Staircase. This is the same company. They were very well known at the turn of the century for their ironwork, and they built all of the crystal palaces. And they were uh, splitting up the company, and we received cases and uh, files and boxes and rolls. And the whole idea was that uh, foundations and uh, government agencies gave us money in order to re-establish those and to really house them in ways that made them clean and accessible to researchers. Now that you're talking about your experiences, I was wondering if you can share with us, uh, in, in a brief way, which was your biggest challenge uh, working with book preservation, book repair? Probably that collection that I first spoke of. It was a, um, a collection of 250,000 plans, and when I went to work with it, I was uh, a, a, an intern alone with a, a supervisor above me, but primarily on my own, and we there was no precedent for what we were doing. It was very little precedent for uh, the kind of volume of plans we were seeing, the variety of plans we were seeing, and as we moved them from the folders of the company, which were dusty and sometimes soot covered, into clean folders, we were looking at, well, some of these are black and white, some of these are white on black, some of them are on cloth, some of them are blue on white, some of them are white on blue. And what are all the chemicals that are involved in these? And how do we find out about that? I was very fortunate to work with a Fulbright scholar. Her name is Eleanor Kissel. She's a conservator in Paris. She was finishing her uh, master's degree from the Sorbonne. And she came in also as an intern. And what we found was that there was a question that we needed to answer. And there were no books that answered it. So we wrote a book. 
we did all the primary research and it was incredibly interesting because she came at it from a paper standpoint and I came at it both from an art standpoint and a photography standpoint and that merging and that teamwork of our different types of experience um, as we brought the information forward into the conservation community everyone was where where do we get this where do we get this and it took us about six years to actually publish to but but it's a book that's still um, in use today all over the country even in Europe um, because no one had written it and that was a wonderful challenge for me to to be able to find a question and go at it now together with the art of preserving and repairing books also technology is playing a major role uh, today and I remember that uh, I was once in Spain in a very old library of the University of Salamanca and they showed me some books that didn't pass the Inquisition, the censorship of the Inquisition uh, in certain areas. So what they did is they blackened the different lines that the church or the censor at that time felt that it was appropriate. But now we can read actually what they were trying to blacken using ultraviolet mm -hmm. uh, light. Tell us about some of the most I important technological contributions that have been made in order to preserve and to research these old books that in different ways have been damaged. I think that the biggest change, you know, since before I uh, got involved in uh, preservation has been the development of professional uh, programs. I came in apprentice trained, so with an art degree, I worked under a conservator who had been trained in the 60s. Um, and she had been trained by conservators from Europe. And that was kind of this handover. And one of the best things that I think that has happened is that there are now professional programs at the Getty, at Columbia University, Queens University, uh, Winterthur at the University of Delaware. Um, uh, there's one at the Randall Research Center in Texas. And they are all places where they've been, begun to combine scientific uh, research, very specific research with the real understanding over time of uh, the hand skills that came in from all of the European binders. And I think that that in itself has been one of the best, you know, that kind of merging. It used to be these two camps, but that merging of those two kinds of knowledge has really uh, improved preservation remarkably. Now, in your evolving career as a book preservationist, you also got into teaching. Yeah. Why? Well, I, um, I was really given an opportunity here at SIUE. I um, met uh, Laura Strand, the professor of textiles, um, in a conversation um, at an opening. And she uh, was really looking for someone to teach papermaking and bookbinding. And I had come out of a bookbinding program as an artist. And so the opportunity to sort of, sort of leap over all the conservation that I had done for years while taking all those skills with me and yet bring it back into this art uh, realm was really exciting for me and teaching my students as you said about that a book is not necessarily just this one codex with pages that it can be a scroll that it can be a, a physical square object and I sort of teach my students to think about what does a book mean what does it mean does it have to have words does it have to have actual pages and we sort of usually work on a definition that brings it down to that it's about time that it's about the passage of time and the using of separate sort of uh, plateaus in order to create that uh, time going by. And that it can be done in a variety of ways. So for instance, I had a student a couple semesters ago who made, he was really interested in graffiti art, and so he photographed all of his tags that he'd done out about the city and whatever. And he made a long scroll, and the two ends were um, spray cans. And so it became kind of a document of his work and then a new way to sort of exercise those ideas. I've had students who made uh, books out of cubes that were magnetized, so every time you turn them, you get a different message as they combine together. So this idea that books can be uh, open to the user's viewing, that it doesn't have to be only one, two, three, four, as we sort of understand books this way, but that it can be many other ways to sort of look at a time experience and how it can be controlled. And after teaching now, you are becoming, uh, you have become the interim director of a university museum. Tell us about the importance of this particular museum at, the, at Southern Illinois University in Edwardsville. So it's been really um, exciting and interesting to get to be uh, a part of this unit. Um, I came in uh, this spring, um, you know, asked by the College of Arts and Sciences to help out. I really didn't know a lot about this particular museum. I had used the collections across campus 
when teaching art history and teaching art appreciation and really love that aspect of the museum here that collections are uh, situated throughout campus. Students can interact with them and it really allows me as a professor to let them understand that art is meant to be experienced, that it's meant to be uh, with you in your classrooms, in your hallways, um, on the campus grounds. Um, and that also that art is uh, everywhere. And one of the things that uh, I see here in this um, program is the av availability of the museum to students and professors. Um, students and professors can come in, make appointments, visit us. For instance, I have a um, student who's coming in tomorrow morning. Uh, she is teaching in the Saturday school um, in art and design to middle schoolers. She's going to come in and select some masks, and we're going to, the staff is going to bring masks over to her classroom so that, you know, younger students can have the ability to, you know, really experience masks from all these different cultures. The museum here has a vast collection. You know, it ranges from the contemporary to the ancient. Uh, it has uh, materials from so many different cultures, and we have professors who access it, you know, both from the sciences, anthropology, history, art. I can't uh, name enough different instances when they've gotten to use it. Okay. Well, in the minute and a half that we have left, more or less, tell us about what is the next big project for you in the museum? What do you expect to accomplish in the next few months? In the next few months, we have been working very hard on um, photographing and beginning our cataloging uh, in, uh, in a, like in a very intensive way. We have a number of collections that we have the basic um, information in, the basic numbers and titles, but we're really doing a little more research in some of those collections. There are graduate assistants who work on those as well as some um, undergraduates. And we are also in the process of uh, looking at how uh, we can take all of the, our collections, which are 60,000 in number, and start to photograph them and get those photographs available to both the faculty and then to the outside uh, public online. That would be something we're just getting into right now. And museums are becoming more and more digitized, right? Yes. It's really exciting. Yeah. And the idea is that, that to make them accessible to anybody anywhere in the world as long as you have a computer and internet access. Yes. Okay. Well, thank you very much to Professor Erin Vignot uh, Dimic, who teaches in the Department of Art and Design at Southern you know, University of Edwardsville, who is an expert in the area of book preservation and many other areas as well, and currently is the interim director of the University Museum at this institution. So thank you very much. And next week, we're going to have Professor Daryl Cohn, uh, who is the chair and professor in the Department of Music at Southern you know, University of Edwardsville, who will be talking about the charm of teaching music or teaching education. So stay tuned. This has been Segway with Dean Aldemaro Romero, a production of the Department of Mass Communications at Southern Illinois University Edwardsville. All rights reserved, 2014.